Husband. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here today. So, in the next few minutes, I'm gonna uh, talk to you about an, an old kid on the block who's ha who has become the queen of the ball, tricuspid regurgitation. Um, so, uh, right heart failure is a clinical syndrome due to alteration of structural and functional, um, structural and function of the heart that leads to suboptimal blood flow to the pulmonary circulation and elevated venous pressures. So, when we have um, uh, right, uh, right ventricular dysfunction, it could be either primary or uh, due to RV function um, decrease, a decrease in, in its contractility, or secondary uh, due to RV pressure or RV volume uh, overload or right atrial remodeling. So uh, the cardiac alterations in patients with right heart failure can vary depending on the cause. However, uh, we, are, we have more or less um, RA, RA or RV dilatation, RV, increased RV filling pressures, and increased CVP. And all these lead to the signs and symptoms of right heart failure that we all know, uh, jugular distension, uh, ascites, um, liver distension, renal failure, uh, malabsorption, um, and due to congestion of the intensine. So when the cardiac output of the right ventricle drops, we have a drop in the uh, alvey filling, the drop of the left ventricle cardiac output, and due to ventricular interdependence, we have increase in alvey filling pressures. So all this uh, results to hypertension, exercise intolerance, uh, shortness of breath, uh, pleural effusion. All these could be symptoms of patients with right heart failure. So uh, in this um, 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 scheme, in this, uh, uh, this picture, uh, we can see what we already know, uh, that the, even though the picture of patients with end-stage right heart failure uh, can be dramatic, in earlier stages, even with severe TR, patients could be asymptomatic or mild symptomatic, and my peripheral edema could be the only sign of, um, of disease. So tricuspid regurgitation might be a cause or a consequence. So uh, right ventricular dysfunction feeds tricuspid regurgitation and tricuspid regurgitation fuel uh, right ventricular um, dysfunction. And uh, the mechanisms associated with uh, right heart failure and TR could be multifactorial. And uh, there have been like more than 200 years since the first recorded description of disease, of disease tricuspid uh, valve to recognize tricuspid regurgitation as a uh, health problem with high uh, mortality. So the Framingham Heart Study showed that the prevalence of clinical significant tricuspid regurgitation in the general population uh, reached up to 5.6 in women and 1.5 in men older than 70 years old. Another report uh, uh, showing the distribution of TR in the community with more than, with 50% uh, of uh, TR being uh, uh, due to left valvular disease and one, a quarter of that uh, due to pulmonary hypertension. 1.6 million U.S. citizens uh, are believed to have moderate or severe TR, and the year mortality is over 10% uh, in these patients, and more than 160,000 new cases per year are recognized. But while we have, like, um, while we have 1.6 million patients with TR, severe TR, the surgical procedure suddenly is less than 8,000. 8, and why is that? Due to excess mortality associated with surgery in functional tricuspid regurgitation. So uh, more than 85% of cases uh, of uh, tricuspid regurgitation is functional. But before going to that, I need to, we need to focus in one, another section, which is called uh, iatrogenic-related TR, and it's uh, TR related with implantation of um, devices. And we all know that the, the annual um, amount of devices that are implanted is increasing uh, yearly. So the TR related to this um, uh, implantation uh, is increasing um, also. So this uh, CIED-induced TR, as it's called, can be divided in primary or secondary. Primary is when it affects and interacts with the, with the lead uh, directly, and it can be found up to 40% of cases, uh, while the secondary uh, can, re can reach the 60% of cases and is um, a progression of the TR that already exists in these patients. So uh, just uh, keep under consideration, when you have patients with, um, uh, uh, with tricuspid regurgitation, RV dilatation, and these patients are, are, are going to have um, a, a lead implantation or because of a pacemaker or a um, defibrillator. So we might need to think if we can go um, leadless, um, if possible, in these patients. 
So um, in this paper uh, published in, uh, by Dreyfus back in 2015, the authors state the obvious, that functional tricuspid regurgitation is not a vulvar disease. Um, it can be caused by different, um, uh, the, it has different causes. Uh, as we said, left-sided heart disease that causes right ventricular remodeling um, has a, uh, affects the tricuspid annulus, uh, but it can be due to atrial fibrillation, the so-called uh, atrial functional tricuspid regurgitation. So we need to assess all this, um, the, the tricuspid regurgitation per se, the, the annulus and the leaflets, uh, the coaptation gap, and the, the tethering or not of the, of the leaflets be, before uh, assessing these patients for any intervention. And the, and the, the authors um, classified these patients in three stages and based on the stage, they offered the, the, the right um, therapy. So the vast majority of um, uh, patients having functional tricuspid regurgitation uh, have uh, heart failure or left-sided heart disease. And um, FGR due to heart failure is associated with impaired quality of life. And um, the more, more studies in the past have been restricted to half ref, but recent data have shown that more than half of all heart failure patients uh, have, have PEF. And uh, it, uh, it's something that we need to consider. So uh, these are uh, reports uh, from, uh, from the past, uh, from like 20 years ago, saying that uh, patients with heart failure with reduced, reduced ejection fraction um, having a worse prognosis and the prognosis gets worse uh, if um, the, the tricuspid regurgitation is more than moderate. Uh, this was a very nice study uh, with a very big amount of patients uh, that had redux, uh, reduced ejection fraction and showed that the prevalence of moderate severe FTR was 23%. Uh, but the author stated that uh, given the fact that the burden of heart failure uh, globally, um, it becomes um, bigger and bigger, this uh, uh, percentage might go, um, might go up. So, uh, the FTR is a strong independent determinant of mortality and should be a therapeutic target. Uh, this, um, uh, this paper uh, has patients with, um, uh, with all the subtypes of heart failure, uh, reduced heart failure, mid-range heart failure, preserved heart failure, and uh, it stated the same thing, that uh, the presence of, of uh, tricuspid regurgitation, moderate or severe, is um, associated with worse uh, prognosis. Um, this paper, uh, and I know there are lots of papers, but I uh, need to focus, focus on three or, uh, or four, uh, so it's for right heart failure, and and in, uh, in this paper, more than 1,000 patients, um, they were staged uh, based on their symptoms, stage one, no symptoms, stage four, um, right heart failure, and it found that the, the fact that the clinical, the clinical stage uh, of, the, uh, of right heart failure was an important prognostic factor um, in patients with right heart failure and tricuspid regurgitation. Um, and the in this paper, the staging was the same. It was pa patients that were meant to have like um, um, a tricuspid um, a surgery, and it stated that patients that were in one, two, three stage of right high failure had better outcomes than patients right four. We know, but it was um, documented as well. So primary hypertension, a very specific and very important factor of uh, uh, FTR. Uh, as we know, uh, the pulmonary hypertension associated with left heart disease and with lung disease are the most common causes. And um, uh, we know that the um, up to 88 percent of patients with uh, reduced ejection fraction are having FTR. And uh, when it comes to precapillary pulmonary hypertension in patients with uh, chronic lung disease, uh, when, the, um, uh, when it's, uh, the pulmonary hypertension is confirmed, TR is very common, and the estimated incidence of pulmonary hypertension in these cases uh, uh, ranges between 7 and 26 cases per 1 million adults. So um, diagnostic workup of tricuspid regurgitation, um, we need to focus on that. And of course, transthoracic echocardiogram is the, the first line. Uh, but it needs to be um, a multimodality um, um, a session to, to assess the tricuspid regurgitation. But I will leave that to the next speakers. Uh, I will focus on right heart catheterization has a key role um, to exclude pulmonary hypertension, to differentiate pre from post capillary phenotypes, and to, uh, finally to define the impact of tricuspid regurgitations. I know you all know this, um, um, these waveforms, uh, just to bring them in your, in your, in your mind. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, when we go through the right heart cath of a patient with tricuspid regurgitation, we might um, encounter this waveform um, in the right, atri uh, right atrium. It's uh, the ventricularization of the right artery pressure. Uh, we have a dominant V wave and the steep Y descent, and we have a fusion of the CV waves. And uh, here I need to mention that the height of the V wave does not correlate with the severity of tricuspid regurgitation, which is a common disbelief. Um, uh, common belief. So in the next um, uh, picture, we show what we all know as Kuzmal sign. And what's that? It's the increase of the right atrial pressure during deep inspiration. Um, and it's uh, indicative of, of, um, uh, of impaired uh, RV compliance. Uh, so the most important thing uh, when assessing these patients with heart failure and tricuspid regurgitation is to find the right diagnosis because the right diagnosis will give us the right treatment. So when it comes to restriction and constriction, uh, this is, as you can imagine, very, very important because not all the patients, um, uh, not uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy cannot have uh, transcatheter intervention treatment. Uh, so uh, the root um, uh, the root sign um, uh, waveform, um, as we, I believe that it was sensitive, but it's not so sensitive and uh, uh, specific for uh, the, uh, the different, uh, differentiation. Uh, however, the, the relationship because between the RV and the LV, LV during the inspiration, during the respiratory cycle is very important, and it, this is what we call ventricular interdependence. So when we have um, an increase in, in the inspiration of both the RV and the LV, LV uh, pressure, and the um, an increase in the diastolic pressures as well, we have, um, this is uh, indicative of restrictive cardiomyopathy. On the other hand, when we have an increase in right ventricular pressure, but this does not follow from an, uh, with an increase in LV pressure, and this could, uh, is a sign of a constrictive pericarditis. Ventricular interdependence has sensitivity and specificity, specificity, sorry, uh, specificity more than all the other findings, hemodynamic findings, um, so it's something we need to focus on remember. Um, of course, with the right heart catheterization, uh, we assess the pulmonary pressure, the wedge pressure, which is also important uh, to see if the, if the patient has post precapillary um, pulmonary hypertension. And now this is probably the only reference I did uh, echo. Um, so there is a very nice report from Lourdes in 2022, if I remember correctly, where it says that the, when the patients were assessed for having trans, uh, transcatheter intervention of the tricuspid regurgitation, and uh, these that were assessed both uh, with, um, um, uh, with uh, echo and invasively, and they found to have uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, they had a, 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 a a poor prognosis, but not as poor as the patients that were uh, referred for transcatheter uh, treatment and they were referred only uh, with, um, uh, with, um, with an echo positive for uh, pulmonary hypertension and they didn't perform right heart cath. That means that these patients, we don't perform transcatheter treatment in patients without right heart cath. Uh, not to mention that we have to do the cardiac output, uh, either with thick or thermodilution, whatever makes us uh, comfortable. And it will be a very brief case of a patient um, in, uh, that um, uh, went for tricuspid um, intervention in our department, 70 year old with ischemic cardiomyopathy. And this is his right heart catheterization. You can, the, you can see the ventricularization of the right arterial pressure and the high PA and the uh, white pressure. So um, when it comes to, to therapy in tricuspid uh, uh, um, uh, regurgitation, so again, we, uh, we mentioned many times because we need to focus on the underlying disease. Uh, there's no point of doing transcatheter intervention with, without knowing what's the, what's the issue, what's the main cause. And it's the only way to interrupt this vicious cycle of tricuspid regurgitation and right heart failure. So uh, just to conclude, uh, tricuspid regurgitation has been identified as a significant clinical challenge in aging society. Uh, a, system, a systemic multi-view and multi-parameter approach is crucial. PSN selection is the key to success, and we should all remember the FTR is notable disease and should not be treated like this. And uh, transcatheter treatment is also the future in TR disease, but very, in very specific patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. A very uh, comprehensive talk. 
Um, I would like to, uh, to do a, a question, and uh, after that we have discussed. Um, in clinical practice, we see patients uh, with um, a severe tricuspid regurgitation, and after one or two years, uh, the TR um, uh, regressed, mm -hmm. it not progressed. Uh, this percentage is uh, approximately 40%. Do you think uh, that we have um, some points that uh, we predict the regression or progression of TR so, um, after a therapeutic? After, uh, yeah. When you, because there are patients that we might see a difference in the, in the tricuspid regurgitation in, on the echo, uh, yeah. but this might have to do with the right, right ventral function. Because sometimes when the RV fails, then the, the diet in the tricuspid regurgitation is, 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 uh, is less. We can't measure it the, the same as it was when they had, the RV function was good. So this, are, uh, this something can happen when we have an RV failure. But we need, what we need is to find these patients before and treat them before. So, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, you, uh, you asked me if uh, what we should find, what we should do in order to uh, to regress, to, to yeah. prevent. So, uh, it depends on the, the stage we have uh, and the clinical um, and the clinical stage and how the patient feel. Because sometimes, uh, um, and of course, it depends on the etiology. So, we need to yeah. find what the issue uh, with yeah. these patients. Because if it's um, if it's ischemic heart disease, we need to focus on the ischemic heart disease. Uh, if it's a cardiomyopathy, we need to focus on the cardiomyopathy. Even put uh, a defibrillator or CRT device and things like that. So, I think that the main thing is to focus on what's the main problem of the tricuspid regurgitation and then if we have done all the guidelines derived things then we can think see if that patient could be referred for something else okay so excellent the presence also of uh, atrial fibrillation plays a crucial role crucial role but uh, then again this is yeah and then again we don't need we don't know how to interfere with atrial fibrillation if the patient is, um, is, is a good candidate for ablation. So okay. this, is a, 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 um, this is something that uh, needs more, um, all the cardiology specialties, I think, the right heart failure and or, heart failure. Uh, or the presence of uh, pulmonary hypertension. This group of patients are uh, Again, we risk. need to define yeah. what kind of pulmonary hypertension. Any uh, comments? I think that um, as time goes by, we also use MRI more and more, exactly. and there are MRI indices uh, of uh, even of RV diastolic mm -hmm. dysfunction now, fibrosis, systolic function you mentioned. So perhaps, and it's not easy to obtain an MRI in all of these patients because there are very many patients, but in, in, in some of these patients, and perhaps we can have comments from the audience, the MRI will give us some predictors about how bad is bad. It's not very easy to, I mean, it's yeah. very expensive, because so that's the reason we can't have is. not every patient, even though they give us lots of, lots of details, more than I could. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, very nice talk. Congratulations. Thank you. So just uh, two points. The one thing is that uh, w women, as you saw, tend to get TR far more than men. Uh, so there is a sex specific this, is this entity. Uh, second, and also you mentioned that it's very important to define the etiology because this defines prognosis and treatment. And the third one, and I think this is very crucial too, is that right heart catheter is a very simple procedure and very often um, um, is It needs to be done in these patients. We can't have treatment without that, in my opinion. Uh, very nice talk. Thank, Thank you very much. I want to ask something. Uh, as you said, the right ventricular function is very important in patients with tricuspid regurgitation because the outcomes are very different if we have a very bad right ventricle. So uh, you have also experience because you have a lot of patients doing transcatheter procedure for TR. How are you evaluating the right ventricle? Which mm -hmm. is your protocol so for the patients in evaluating the right ventricle mm -hmm. function? Mm -hmm with 3D echo, are you doing MRI in all of them or in some of them? No. Or which, which are the protocols? So depending, um, so because we, we, we do lots of, uh, you know, um, we have new 
new devices and we are part of trials and things like that. Every trial has its own protocol, but most of them, um, they need a transthoracic echo, uh, but we do, a transesophageal echo, uh, of course, um, and, uh, uh, and pending on what other comorbidities, we, can, we do a CT scan of the heart, but MRI is not in the protocol. Uh, if someone has it, it's okay, but we normally don't do MRIs in these patients uh, routinely. Uh, I mean, for the right ventricle, are for, you using TAPSI, for example? Are you using uh, what uh, you are you mean the, the echo? Yes, the, the echo. Ah, okay, for, you yeah, wanted to go right through that. So, yeah, so, uh, and it's, and it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's the next, uh, next yeah, but we do to the eyes, we do TAPSI, we do things like that. Yeah. But, uh, okay. yeah, we do but that. we have also the Dr. Samargati, please, your comments. Yes, thank you for having me here. I hope my voice is very clear. Yeah, first of all, congratulations on the very nice talk. And it's a very hot topic now, having transcatheter and tricuspid regurgitation of disease. But I think the most important slide that you have presented is the, from that nice paper saying tricuspid valve isn't a valvular disease, actually it's a consequences of multi other pictorial. So evaluation the etiology of the TR going starting from the basic echo, tap, CPA pressure, and then maybe right heart cap and let the give you a, a roadmap where to go with. And I agree with you, like for example, there is a vicious cycle going with dilatation of the RA, the RV, and so and so. And those patients, unfortunately, they are good until they're not good. So you have to define what is the best point to pick those patients before they go into the last end stage of heart disease. So I think we used to say, for example, rate with versus rhythm control in atrial fibrillation. But I think maybe now we are shifting gears, we're looking at the things differently and actually considering earlier ablation. If you catch these patients in the early stage, maybe we just cardiovert them with a very simple maneuver that and going to the expensive cardio ablation and going with these expensive procedure. So now I think in the last five years, everyone is looking at it differently in terms of the analysis the investigation, and afterward, like, you know, even the approach, people are going more aggressively targeting the etiology of the problem and the root of the problem rather than the consequence of the problem itself. So very nice talk. I uh, admire the way you, we approached it. And the add to it, we can also include RARB uh, coupling also. It will also help you sometimes, as we mentioned, the PA pressure and pulmonary hypertension where to direct. Sometimes you are, you want to help the people, but sometimes you cannot. So having a full image, full perspective, and you direct then or tailor the treatment based on each patient individually. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we have to continue so to the next presentation.